Welcome to the second of our series of daily devotions this week, in which we are considering some of the people most closely involved in the events of the first Easter. Yesterday we considered the women who were the first to discover that the tomb was empty and to meet with the risen Lord Jesus. Today, by contrast, we're going to consider a group of people who were utterly determined not to meet the risen Lord Jesus at any costs, the Pharisees and the chief priests and the guards who were posted at the tomb. These events are only recorded in Matthew's Gospel, you can find it in chapters 27 and 28, and demonstrate the chief priests and Pharisees were so scared of Jesus, even after they'd had him crucified and seen his body laid in the tomb, that they were prepared to stop at nothing to ensure that he didn't do what he promised and rise again on the third day. So it is a day later in the midst of the Passover Sabbath that panic sets in amongst the chief priests and the Pharisees as they recall the words of Jesus and his promise that after three days I will rise again, and they head off to meet with Pilate. The first thing we notice here is the blatant disregard of the chief priests and the Pharisees for the Sabbath commandment. Back in chapter 12 of Matthew's Gospel, it was Jesus' healing of the man with a shriveled arm on the Sabbath that so enraged the Pharisees that they went out and plotted how they might kill him. Now, having succeeded in their aim, or so they thought, and having had Jesus killed, they're so scared of what might happen next that they're prepared to blatantly disregard the same Sabbath commandment, not out of a desire to restore someone to wholeness, but out of fear for their own positions in society. The second thing we notice here is the chief priests and Pharisees were much more, much more aware of Jesus' promise to rise again than the disciples themselves were. Even after they'd seen the empty tomb, John tells us, the disciples who were there believed, but didn't understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise again. The chief priests and the Pharisees were motivated by fear, expressed as a fear the disciples would steal Jesus' body and tell the people that he'd been raised from the dead. But this was surely just a cover for the fact that they were afraid that Jesus was right all along, that he would rise from the dead just as he said he would, and that they would be shown for what they really were. Pilate tells them to take a guard to make the tomb as secure as possible. It's unclear whether the soldiers were Roman or from the palace guard, but it's likely they were the latter. And just to make doubly sure, the tomb was secured with a string sealed at each end across the stone with a blob of clay. While such precautions might have acted as a deterrent for any potential body snatchers, a few troops and a bit of string was never going to stop the power of the creator of heaven and earth from raising his son to life again. Matthew tells us that on the morning of the first day of the week there was a violent earthquake as the angel of the Lord came down and rolled the stone away, and that the guards were so afraid of the angel that they shook and became like dead men. So much then for securing the tomb. A little later they go into the city and report to the chief priests everything that had happened. For the chief priests and the Pharisees their worst nightmare has come true, so they buy the guards silence, giving them a large sum of money in return for them, saying that the disciples came during the night and stole the body while they were asleep, and promising to provide cover for the soldiers should news of this ever get back to Pilate. A failing such as this would often end up with the guards being summarily executed, as happened to the guards who were supposed to be guarding Peter in jail in Acts chapter 12. The soldiers took the money and did as they were told, and the story, Matthew tells us, has been widely circulated amongst the Jews to this very day. We believe Matthew's Gospel to have been written about 30 years later, sometime between about AD 60 and 65. But it's interesting to note, isn't it, that 2,000 years on, there are now estimated to be something over 2 billion followers of Jesus Christ in the world, whilst the account of the soldiers is consigned to be nothing more than a very obscure footnote of history. So we have to ask ourselves why the Pharisees were so scared of Jesus. After all, if he was just another rabble rouser, another in a long line of cranks claiming to be the Messiah, and there were plenty of them around at the time of Jesus, what did they have to be afraid of? They'd seen to it that Jesus was executed and laid in a tomb, so why go to such elaborate and ultimately completely ineffective lengths to try and prevent his body from being taken? After all, the one thing the Jewish authorities had to do to quash the whole thing was to produce Jesus' dead body, even if the disciples had stolen it, given the resources that they had available to them, it wouldn't have been difficult for them to find it. And even today, there are those who, like the Pharisees, are afraid of the truth of Jesus Christ, who focus their energies on trying to refute the truth about Jesus. I'm sure, we can all think of individuals who do so very prominently and publicly, 
But if God doesn't exist, which he most certainly does, and if the gospel is nothing more than an elaborate fiction, which it plainly isn't, why do they devote so much time, effort and energy to refuting it, unless they're afraid of the truth of the message? The reality it is that rather than fearing Jesus, it's only in him that we can have life in all its fullness. And the truth is, as the great Easter acclamation reminds us, Christ is risen, to which I hope we can all respond. He's risen indeed. Alleluia. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the eternal truth of your gospel. Help us to know that truth day by day. We pray that by the power of your Spirit, you would work in the hearts and minds of those who are frightened of and who rail against those eternal truths for whatever reason, and that you would bring them to trust in your redeeming love.